us. It is a pleasure to have Dr. Jocelyn Bell Burnell here with us today to deliver a lecture on pulsars, magnetars, and fast radio bursts. Dr. Jocelyn Bell Burnell discovered pulsars as a graduate student in radio astronomy at Cambridge, which opened up a new branch of astrophysics and whose work was recognized by the award of a Nobel Prize given to a supervisor. She has subsequently had many roles in various branches of astronomy. She is now a visiting professor at Oxford and the Chancellor of University of Dundee, Scotland. She has chaired, served on, and serviced many research council boards, committees, and panels, and has also chaired a European Community Committee. She has been the president of the Royal Astronomical Society. In 2008, she became the first female president of Institute of Physics, and in 2014, the first female president of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. She was one of the members of the small group of women scientists to set up the Athena Swan scheme in 2005. In 2018, she was awarded one of the biggest cash prize awards in science, the Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics for her discovery of pulsars in 1967, which she characteristically donated to support PhD studentships from underrepresented groups. It is our utmost honor to have a person like her here with us today. And we all extend to you our warmest welcome, ma'am. Over to you. Thank you very much. So thank you to the tech team and to Tanvi in particular. And thank you to everybody else for being here and listening in. I want to talk today about some recent developments in the field of pulsars or closely related fields. But I'll start by talking a bit about pulsars and then go on to talk about, excuse me a moment, bring that up. I will talk first of all about pulsars and then go on to some of the newer things, magnetars and fast radio bursts. So I'm going to start by reminding you what radio astronomy is. I suspect a lot of people in Pune will know what radio astronomy is, is radio astronomy is, <coughs> excuse me, but I will start near the beginning. So this diagram shows the whole of the electromagnetic spectrum the family of light. And the light that we can see with our eyes is in the center of the diagram, that little rainbow. But there are many, many other similar frequencies that our eyes cannot see. And in particular, if we go to the left of that little rainbow, out of the red end of the spectrum, we come to infrared, you may know of infrared through infrared heaters, infrared lamps. We keep going to the left, we come to millimeter, things like microwave ovens, microwave links, you may have heard of. We keep going further to the left, we get to the VHF band, television. We keep going a little bit further, we come into radio. And the pulsar and to some extent, the magnetar story are radio astronomy stories. We can do astronomy across the whole width of that spectrum, from the radio through the optical. Excuse me, ma'am. Hello? Yeah, uh, just a minute. There is There seems to be some problem in the live stream. Uh, would you please wait for a minute or so? Sure. Thank you.
Uh, sorry, ma'am. Yeah, you can start. Should I start again? Uh, no, ma'am. You can start with uh, this slide only. Right. Thank you very much. So, this slide shows the whole of the electromagnetic spectrum with the colored bit in the middle being the bits that our eyes respond to, the optical. I'm going to be talking mainly about radio astronomy, which is off to the left at the lower frequencies and longer wavelengths than light. But they are basically the same kinds of radiation. The first big radio telescope in the world was in Britain at Jodrell Bank. It is still standing and it has recently been given world heritage status. So the university has to keep paying for it to keep it up. People in Pune may be aware of the GMRT, India's big radio telescope, which I have had the privilege of visiting. It's magnificent. So radio telescopes like the GMRT, the Jodrell Bank one, and many others around the world are being used today to study all sorts of things. But in particular, there are people using them to study pulsars, magnetars, and fast radio bursts. The image on the left is a cartoon of a pulsar. It's a very small star, about 10 kilometers radius, that spins. It has a very strong magnetic field, and out from the magnetic field poles, there come beams of radio waves. And if the beam shines on us, we see a pulse like now, not now, now, but not now, now, but not now. There are some pulsars that we do not see at all because neither beam shines on us. The image on the right is filling out a little bit more of the detail. You can see the spin axis vertically. I hope you can see my cursor, the spin axis. The magnetic axis is offset. And near the magnetic poles, the field lines make a cone shape. And this focuses a beam of radio waves, which then sweep around the sky, as in the animation on the left. Pulsars are very small, as I said about before, about 10 kilometers radius, very dense. A thimbleful of one of these stars would weigh the same as the whole population of the Earth. And they're made largely of particles called neutrons. So we also know of them as neutron stars. Because there's a lot of material packed into a very small space, they've got extremely strong gravity. They also have very strong electric and magnetic forces, and they spin quite fast. The animation I showed you was on the slow side for pulsars. Most of them spin faster than that. We believe they're formed when a massive star ends its life with an explosion, a giant explosion that we call a supernova. And in this explosion, most of the material of the star gets kicked out into space, but the central parts of the star get kicked against and get compressed, shrunk much, much smaller. As this rotating star core shrinks, it spins faster. That's conservation of angular momentum. And so we see these things spinning once a second, twice a second, 10 times a second, 100 times a second. And they produce this beam of radio waves from over their magnetic poles, and these beams sweep around the sky. They are seen primarily in the radio. One or two you can see in the visible, but only one or two. 
you can see a number of them at X-ray wavelengths or at gamma ray wavelengths. And today there's at least 2,700 known, of which only about 20 are visible. About 100 you see in X-rays. Rather surprisingly, more, about 200 in the gamma ray band. Of these pulsars, about 10% of them are in binary star systems. They're twinned with another star. Many of the stars up in the sky are in binary systems. They're in pairs going round each other. And if one of the stars becomes a pulsar, the binary system may hold together. It will, may not break up always. And so you get a pulsar going round a more ordinary star. We have one example of a pulsar going round a pulsar. That is rare. And we know of one in a triple system. A pulsar goes round a white dwarf star. And those two go round yet another star. And we know of a few with planets as well. And there's maybe 100,000 of them in the galaxy. But of course, we only see those whose beam sweeps across the Earth. And the vast majority will not sweep across the Earth. One of the most famous pulsars is in the Crab Nebula. This was a star that exploded a little over a thousand years ago. It was observed by the ancient Chinese and written down in their archives. The collapsed core of that star that exploded is now a pulsar or a neutron star. And for a long time, there was a big puzzle about how this nebula kept shining, why it was not dimming. It emits what's called synchrotron radiation. That's due to energetic electrons. And those electrons ought to gradually lose their energy and it ought to become dimmer. But it wasn't becoming dimmer. So what was going on? Well, the answer turns out to be the pulsar in its center. The pulsar keeps supplying energy to the electrons in the nebula and keeps the nebula shining at its same bright level. So a little bit more about the properties of pulsars. They're a little bit heavier than the sun. So they're a few thousand, million, 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 million tons. That's pretty massive. They have a radius of about 10 kilometers, or if you're British, you might find it easier to understand a diameter of about 10 miles. Either way, they're very small, and that is an awful lot of tons packed into a very small ball. So the average density of a pulsar is like the density of the nucleus of the atom. And because these stars are rich in the particle called neutrons, they're sometimes called neutron stars. To give you an idea of the density, if you take a thimble, a nice sewing thimble like this one, and fill it full of pulsar material, then that thimble would weigh the same as if it had the whole population of the Earth crushed into it. And when you get that much material in a small space, you have strong gravity. So pulsars have very strong surface gravity. There's also a strong gradient of gravity. So there are tidal effects. And of course, there is very condensed matter physics inside them. The extreme gravity also causes light rays to bend. So if I were to stand on the surface of one of these stars without moving, I could see 20 or 30 degrees over the horizon. 
I could see something like half the star or the surface of half the star without moving. And strong gravity also redshifts light. So if there were little green men on these stars, to us, they would look like little red men because of the redshift. But actually, I don't think anything could survive on the surface of these stars. Gravity also affects clocks. You probably already know this. If you have a mobile phone that tells you your position from checking with satellites, then your phone knows to allow for the effect of Earth's gravity on the clocks down here, which will go slower than the clocks up in the satellites, which are in lower gravity. So your sat nav corrects for the effect that gravity has on um, the rate of things. If your sat nav did not correct for the effect of gravity on clocks, then your position given by your sat nav would be something like 10 kilometers wrong. So your sat nav knows general relativity, which is what we're talking about here. It's pretty clever. Not only is the gravity of a pulsar strong, there's quite a strong gradient of gravity. So if you come in to land on one of these things, and let's say you're coming in feet first, the gravitational attraction on your feet is much stronger than the gravitational attraction on your head. And your body gets pulled long and thin. But then it also starts getting pulled apart. So strong are these tidal forces. So I would not recommend going visiting a pulsar or a neutron star. You will not come back alive if you try landing on one. There's a health warning, as you can see. These pulsars have very large magnetic fields, typically about 100 million Tesla. To put that in context, um, I don't know if you have them in India, but in Britain, we have little magnets we can put on our fridge. There's usually little pictures or slogans on the magnets. And those fr fringe magnets are about one hundredth of a Tesla. If you were a researcher, a physics researcher, and you had a magnet of 10 Tesla, you'd be pretty proud of it. That is a strong lab magnet but pulsars are millions of times bigger. And if you spin a magnetic field, you get a voltage drop. And because in this case, we have a spinning star with a large magnetic field, we're getting voltage drops of about 10 billion volts per centimeter. So although the gravity is very strong, as I explained, the electromagnetic forces are billions of times stronger than the gravitational. These stars are very good timekeepers. Once you get one of these stars spinning, it's really difficult to change its spin. It just keeps spinning. And so they're accurate to about one part in 10 to the power 16 one part in 10,000 million million. Or put differently, the rotation period of a typical pulsar has increased by about one second since the age of the dinosaurs. And this is useful. It means we have a number of very accurate clocks dotted around the universe or the near bit of the universe. And so we can use these clocks to test Einstein's theories. So we're beginning to use pulsars to check out Einstein's theories now. And I have to say, so far, Einstein's theories check out very nicely. Thank you. But we're not done yet. And so to move on to magnetars, which seem to be relatives of pulsars. 
they also are these neutron stars, but they've got even stronger magnetic fields than the pulsars, 10 to 1,000 times bigger. They also spin more slowly, but they have been seen to speed up and slow down quite rapidly. We think, like neutron stars, they're formed in supernova explosions. In fact, about 10% of the supernova explosions that would give uh, pulsars actually give magnetars. But they do only seem to have a short lifetime, probably about 10,000 years, which means there are a lot of magnetars that have been and gone on it and are now up there in the galaxy as dead magnetars. Probably about 30 million dead magnetars, if we understand the physics correctly. So there are these things with a lot of gravity sitting there and maybe not showing themselves. They seem to have something a bit like earthquakes, which we call starquakes. These star quakes give short bursts of X-rays and gamma rays, flares, which last perhaps only a tenth of a second. They're probably caused by the magnetic field dropping. And the strength of one of these X-rays or gamma ray flares is equivalent to what comes off our sun, the sunlight, in 100,000 years. But we still only know a few dozen of these. But they have become more center stage just recently, as I will go on to explain. Because I want to talk now about fast radio bursts. And I have to remind you of some physics as well before we get too far into this. You have seen rainbows. You've maybe seen light split up by a prism. White light spread out into the spectrum. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. This happens because the light, white light, light rays, travel at different speeds through the raindrop or the glass prism, depending on their frequency or their wavelength, their color. And so they go different angles, and the red ends up in a slightly different place from the orange and from the green and the blue and the purple. And so you get this nice spectrum. Something similar can happen with radio waves. You can get this dispersion, the different frequencies behaving slightly differently, the different wavelengths behaving slightly differently. I have no idea whether this audio is going to work, but if it doesn't, we have the graph anyway. So imagine there is a lightning flash, a lightning stroke on the far side of the Earth. That produces a sharp burst of radio waves of lots of frequencies. And those radio waves travel around in a big loop following the Earth's magnetic field and come down where you are. But as the radio waves pass electrons, free electrons, the different frequencies or the different wavelengths behave differently. The highest frequency radio waves go through with the least trouble. The lowest frequency radio waves get considerably held up by those electrons that it's come past. And what started as a single flash <coughs> ends up being a descending note, a whistle that goes. <whistles> and I'll try playing this audio. We'll see if it works. You'll hear a lot of crackle, a lot of static. And then in the middle, there's one of these whistles. Let's see what happens. Thank you. 
I hope you heard that. Um, but the important thing to remember is that the sound is characterized by this descending curve. It starts at high frequencies and goes lower and lower and lower, this descending whistle. Radio astronomers who study pulsars are also studying sharp, short radio bursts that as they travel through space, meet some electrons and similarly get dispersed. So if you looked at a pulse with two radios tuned to slightly different frequencies, the one tuned to higher frequency would pick it up first and a moment later, the one tuned to lower frequencies. So pulses from pulsars also follow this descending curve. Uh, sorry. And how fast it descends depends on how many electrons there were that it met along its journey. If the radio wave is local, lost my cursor. Um, there's the cursor. If the radio wave is local, there are very, very few electrons. All the radio frequencies arrive at once, and it's like that. Or here, where you have a pair of short bursts, again, very, very local, and they, the band is vertical. Now, people who study pulsars want to be able to distinguish between radio interference from nearby on Earth uh, that from a pulsar, which is a way out in space. And because the radio signals from pulsars are weak, the radio telescopes are big and sensitive and all too often can pick up local radio interference. It might be somebody with a badly suppressed motorbike. It might be somebody tinkering with a radio in a nearby room. It might be an arc welder. It might be sparks of any sort on a transmission line or whatever. Lots of things can give radio interference. And so radio astronomers automatically display their data with this sort of visual. So here we have examples of two pulses. The top panel in each case shows the radio signal received. And you can see the pulse in the middle of each of those frames. The left-hand one is rather weaker pulse. It's a bit jagged, and there's rather more noise before and after. The one on the right is a very strong, clean pulse, and there's less noise around. And below, in each case, you have this same curved curve. And what you're looking for is this curved descending line, which shows that the radio signal is dispersed, and it's not local. If it was local, in this right-hand case, the line would be vertically down. So radio astronomers are automatically looking for this curved curve that goes along with the pulse. So, next slide here, nasty yellow background, but never mind. On this nasty yellow background, you can see a very nice curved curve. And the inset shows the pulse, it's beautifully strong and very clean and way, way above the noise level. Absolutely no doubt about that being a good pulse. And because this line is curved, it says it's not local. It's not from the earth. It's from a way out in space. Now, by seeing how flat this line is, whether it goes down like this, or whether it goes down much, 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 much more gently, you get a measure of how many electrons the radio wave has come past on its journey to us. And the radio astronomers quickly realized that the number of electrons in this case was an awful lot, far more than our galaxy could provide. So where, what was going on? Where were all the electrons to give the curve this flat, a true curve, but requiring an awful lot of electrons. If it's more, ele more electrons than we have in the galaxy, then if you imagine yourself heading out in space towards 
whatever produced this burst, you go out through the galaxy, notching up a fair number of electrons, but not enough. And then you get to the edge of the galaxy and you're in pretty empty space and there aren't many electrons. So you have to go a huge distance to notch up the necessary number of electrons. And this was in fact the first fast radio burst detected. But because their conclusions about the number of electrons were so startling, it must be extragalactic and a long, long way extragalactic, they were very cautious about publishing this result. They did, but for a long time, people weren't sure they believed it. And then finally, we started finding some more, also extragalactic, way out in space beyond our galaxy. That people felt, okay, well, that first one must have been real. They must have been right. And so this whole field of fast radio bursts, fast, because they're very, very short, up and down, very quickly. And they're radio and they're a burst. So they're fast radio bursts. Now, nobody had ever seen anything from this particular position in the sky before. And as we began to find more fast radio bursts, that was increasingly the case. We didn't know of anything there. Mind you, we couldn't position it terribly accurately, but even so, it wasn't obvious what was causing it. And they didn't often repeat. In fact, they mostly don't repeat. So it could be something catastrophic, you know, like a giant supernova explosion, the end of something. If there, if there is a repeat, you know it's not terminal. It's not the end of it all. It has to be around to do another burst at some point. And the optical astronomers didn't know of anything peculiar from those places then, and nor did the infrared astronomers, and nor did the X-ray astronomers, and so on. So it was a bit of a puzzle. And it remains one of the big, big puzzles in astronomy these days. Just what are these fast radio bursts? We've got a bit more information, but it's intriguing. We've seen about 3,000 of these bursts now, and they're all outside our galaxy, raised up to about one. A handful have been seen to repeat. And one of the interesting steps along the way, the track in this discovery process, comes from Australia, from the Parkes Radio Telescope. The Parkes Radio Telescope was seeing some of these bursts like other radio telescopes. It was also seeing another, a number of something else that didn't look quite the same. And they seem to be occurring from all over the sky. And quite a lot of them. It was a bit disturbing. You know, what's going on here? And they could not make sense of it until a graduate student made a plot of when these bursts occurred, plotted against local time. And there was a peak, a strong peak, between 12 noon and 1 p.m., what do folk do between 12 noon and 1 p.m.? They go have lunch. There's a staff common room at the Parks Observatory, and there's a microwave oven there where people can heat up their lunch. But they knew the microwave oven was not a problem because they had tested it and tested it. You don't really want microwave ovens at radio astronomy sites unless you're really sure that they don't leak radiation, that they don't leak microwaves. So they knew it didn't leak. So they couldn't fully understand it. Until they discovered, and listen up, because you might do this and it's not good for you. Until they discovered that some people stop the microwave to take out their lunch, they stop the microwave by opening the door not by pressing the stop button. And if you stop a microwave oven by opening the door, there is a short blast of microwaves gets out 
before it shuts off. And those blasts of microwaves hit you in the chest. So please, please, if you're using a microwave oven, stop it using the stop button. Do not open the door to stop it. There no longer is a microwave oven at Parkes Radio Telescope. And those funny, unexplained other kinds of radio bursts have stopped happening. Which leaves us with the big problem of what are the original fast radio bursts. Because we still haven't got an explanation for them. An Australian radio telescope, the prototype for the square kilometre array, has lots and lots of dishes. And they used it in what they called a fly's eye mode. So each dish is looking in a slightly different direction. And using this, they have managed to pick up some burst and get positions for them. And this diagram is from the paper announcing the positions of the first four that they found. So the greeny yellowy lodge is a measure of the radio emission from that bit of the sky. And they're looking at galaxies in every case. The red X marks the center of the galaxy. And where you can see it, the white circle is where the radio burst was coming from. So for instance, in this bottom left diagram, the source of the, X, of the radio burst is quite some way out from the center of the galaxy, but I dare say there are still stars there. This the right one, uh, it's a nice spiral galaxy. You can see the spiral arms picked up in the radio. And this source is something in a spiral arm. That doesn't honestly help us a lot, it has to be said, but uh, doubtless we can improve the technique. The top right one, the positioning is much less precise. It's quite a big oval. And I can't readily see the white circles in the other diagrams, so I, I won't try and talk about them. But you get the idea. Um, they're from somewhere in a spiral galaxy, usually quite a massive spiral galaxy. So it's something from amongst 100,000 million stars, which maybe is progress. Yeah, it is progress. But we have some way to go before we understand what this is. The Canadians have a new radio telescope, which is called Chine. It's set in the west of the country, in amongst the Rockies. So you can see some of the mountains in the background, and that provides good screening. It's a fairly simple radio telescope. It consists of four cylindrical troughs. But it's being very good at picking up fast radio bursts. It's probably the machine that's picking up the most now, although it was designed to study hydrogen in the universe. It's interesting because it works at lower frequencies than all the other radio telescopes we use. So we're getting some information on how wide a spectrum these bursts happen over. It's not terribly good at positioning things as it stands, but they're commissioning a couple of tiny telescopes, which they call outriggers, which they're going to put over on the east side of the country. And those little outrigger radio telescopes will be very, very simple. Um, if CHIME itself sees a burst, it says to those little radio telescopes, did you see something? And if they did, they say, yep, saw something. And if they didn't, they say nothing. So between these three telescopes, we'll get better positions for these things. But there's a lot more work to do in understanding these objects, I have to say. They're very exciting, but still a long way to go in understanding them. So that's where we are with pulsars, with magnetars, and with fast radio bursts. And as I hope you can see, there's a lot happening and a lot of questions we have to answer. And some answers, but not enough. And that's often the way with research. You get many questions before you get answers. That's the fun of it too.
Thank you for your attention and thank you for your interest. It was a great talk, Jocelyn. We all liked it a lot. So now we can move on to the question and answer session. Yes. So if anyone has any questions, you can drop it in the chat box or raise your hand and the host can unmute you. So if there are any questions, okay. Yeah, Teja, I have asked you to unmute. You can. Uh, hello, ma'am. Hello. I'm Teja. Uh, I'm interested in astronomy. So actually, um, my doubt is that uh, um, uh, what exactly is gravity? And in detail, uh, it means much, right? Gravity, there, there's two ways of thinking about gravity. You can think of it as one object pulling on another object, like the Earth pulls on us or the earth pulls on the moon, or the sun pull, pulls on the earth and the moon. But another way of thinking about gravity is the way a heavy body will curve space, space-time. Um, if you have a nice soft mattress on your bed, and you put something small and heavy on that mattress, it makes a little dip. Space-time gets dips in it from heavy bodies like stars. Well, also from people, but the dips are very, very small. And those dips, um, for instance, um, pull things into them. Things roll into the dips. And light rays also get bent as they go past dips. So gravity can also affect light rays. So another way of thinking of gravity is as... Um, deformations in space-time. But probably you don't want to think about it that way for a little bit yet. Maybe it's just in terms of objects attracting each other. So we have Baljit over here who wants to ask a question. Baljit, you can unmute. Yes. Ma'am, uh, pulsars are densely packed with uh, neutrons which are essentially neutral. So what is the reason for the extreme electromagnetic forces? They've got a very strong magnetic field. And if you spin a magnetic field, you get electromagnetic effects. Question is, how or why do they have a strong magnetic field? And we don't really understand that, I have to say. <laughs> There is one question in the chat box from RT. So she wants to ask whether all neutron stars turn into pulsars or magnetars. And we say that the magnetars die after some time, but what about pulsars? Yeah, pulsars do ultimately die. They're gradually slowing. and they, After maybe a million years, 10 million years, they just slow so much, they don't generate any radio waves. So they stop pulsing. Um, same is true probably of guitars, uh, we assume. So they end up as invisible but quite heavy lumps in space because they'll still sit there and they still have gravity so they can attract anything that comes too close. So they probably gradually get bigger and heavier with stronger gravity, but you don't see them. Okay. So, Hansrud, uh, you can unmute and ask your question. Ma'am, I have a doubt. Ma'am, how do pulsars and magnetars, magnetars die and what happens to them after they die? Right. Um, not too sure with magnetars, but probably the same as pulsars. They probably gradually die and you're left with a neutron star, a serious navigational hazard because you can't see them. The only clue you get is the way they might bend light. So yeah, probably probably the same with magnetars. And ma'am, is there any difference between a pulsar and neutron star? 
I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. There's a lot of distortion on the line. Could you try saying it again slowly? He wants to ask, is there any difference between a pulsar and neutron star? Means All right, thank you. Um, a pulsar is a neutron star, but not all neutron stars are pulsars. So pulsars are a subset of neutron stars, we suspect. So we have Suman, she can ask. Thank you, ma'am, for such a presentation. I have a question. Uh, there are some kind of pulsars called uh, part-time pulsars, which certainly stop pulsing, and they again, then again, after some time, they start pulsing. So what could be the reason of such, such kind of uh, part-time job? Uh, this is my question. That's a good question. And the quick answer is, we don't know. But it does seem that some pulses are shut off for a little bit, go quiet for a little bit. Um, sometimes it's just a few pulses and then they pick up again. There is one other phenomenon that can make it hard to see a pulsar, even though the pulsar is pulsing. And that's called scintillation. I talked earlier about how electrons affect radio waves, change the speed of radio waves. If you have a cloud of electrons in space, they can cause the radio wave to change direction. And maybe if a radio signal from a pulsar meets too many of these clouds of electrons, its direction of travel gets changed so much it misses the Earth. And the astronomers can't see that pulsar until those clouds of electrons go past. It's a phenomenon called scintillation. Uh, we can see it uh, with our eyes when we look at stars at night. We see them twinkling, changing their brightness. This is a bit the same thing only in the radio, and it happens on a much longer time scale. It's a slower process. So you maybe see them for a month and then they disappear for two weeks and then they come back for three and a half months and disappear for four weeks and so on. It's a bit random. Thank you. Uh, uh, so Darshana, you can unmute and ask your question. Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, uh, I would like to ask, uh, how do we exactly calculate the age of a pulsar or a magnetar? Yeah, that's, uh, I'm not sure we are calculating it precisely, but we're making an estimate of it. If you study a normal radio pulsar, you'll find that it's gradually slowing down. Not very fast, but gradually slowing down. It's getting tired, and that's why it's slowing down. And there'll come a stage where its rotation speed is so slow that even though there may still be strong magnetic fields, uh, there's not enough oomph in the system to generate radio waves. And so it stops having a beam that it swings around the sky. So it's to do with the rotation gradually slowing and maybe the magnetic field weakening a bit as well. We're not quite sure about that, but certainly they slow their speed. Ramaswamy, you can ask your question. Hello, ma'am. Uh, so, yeah, my question is like actually, I was working on dark matter, and uh, so we know like uh, we uh, binary pulsars are used to test uh, uh, general relativity, so test gravities. So, is there any possibilities to uh, test uh, nature of dark matter using binary pulsars, or is there any way using radio? Uh, I don't think you can check out dark matter using pulsars, but there is an interesting thing being done or being thought about to do with fast radio bursts. Um, the fast radio burst dispersion tells us how many electrons it has come past. And you could use that as a proxy for the number of baryons. And so it may be that 
studying fast radio bursts will give us information on whether there are baryons missing from our counting, the missing baryon problem. Okay. It's going to be a bit approximate, I think, but it's certainly worth doing um, for the time being. Uh, thank you. Okay, so uh, can we uh, shift on towards the YouTube questions for a bit, Jessalyn? You can, I will send it to you in your chat box. Uh, yeah, so you can see that questions. Yep. Yes, okay. Shall I start up the top? Yeah. So the first one is, how do pulsars and magnetars die and what happens to them? They die because they gradually slow to a speed where they're not producing radio signal. They're still there with their gravity, but unless something spins them up, we're not going to be able to see them with radio waves. Um, the next one is about fast radio bursts and gamma ray bursts. Are they associated? It's not obvious that fast radio bursts are associated with gamma ray bursts. Um, at least we haven't yet seen an immediate link. So no, for the moment, is the answer. <laughs> um, do all neutron stars turn into pulsars or magnetars? Also, we learned that magnetars die. What about pulsars? Do they die? Um, Actually, uh, these are, I guess, no. repeating questions. Uh, you can see my private message box. I have Prano has sent it me, showed Prano Tech Team that message. I've sent you privately. Um, I'm, not, I'm still working with the Zoom group chat. Okay. So can I uh, just again uh, send them in public chat so you can see them? I think as long as I can see the group chat, so I'm not sure I can see anything else. Okay, I've sent, it's uh, entitled YouTube questions. I've sent right. in group chat. Can you see them now? It will be at the end of the group chat. You can scroll down and... Yeah. Not come through yet, but okay, so Jocelyn, ma'am, till then uh, we have Professor Sanjeev Dhurandar over here from is one from Vish Vishal Gupta. Is that one of them? Uh, no, I guess you are not seeing. So for a uh, Jocelyn, ma'am, for a moment, uh, we have uh, Sanjeev Dhurandar, sir from Ayuka over here. So he wants to have a word with you, so I can. Yeah, Sanjeev sir, I have unmuted you and you can unmute yourself and ask. Hello, uh, Sanjeev sir, you can unmute and ask your question. Oh, hello, yes. Now you're here, I'm heard. Okay. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to ask about, about this fast radio burst. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the source of this uh, fast radio burst? I mean, could they be compact objects which are merging or something like that? In that case, can one make a gravitational wave observation with the LIGO, Virgo, and uh, yeah. also see them on radio? We don't know what makes fast radio bursts, but it probably is a compact object. Wow. But for it to give out gravitational radiation, it will need probably to move. You're right. Orbiting another star, for instance. If it was doing that, then you might be able to pick up the gravitational waves from it. Right. If it just sits there occasionally bursting i don't think there'll be enough gravitational waves yeah. for us to be able to detect it for quite a while yet yeah thank you yeah so jocelyn ma'am i can just read out the questions from youtube for you is that fine yeah thank you yeah so one question from youtube is uh, can we use pulsars like the crab pulsar 
in M to be used for calculations of the standard candles. I doubt if pulsars are reliable enough in intensity to be used as standard candles. Um, it's too much dependent on both what's happening in the pulsar and in the medium between the space between us and the pulsar. But they can be used as clocks. The, the pulse timing is very, very accurate, even if the um, other dimensions are not so accurate. So the next question is, uh, why do pulsars execute the precision motion and what is the reason behind its high angle? I'm sorry, the, the line got a bit noisy. Could you say uh, that again? Okay. So why do pulsars execute the precision motion and what is the reason behind its high angular momentum? Again, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not hearing properly. Hello? Can you say it very slowly? The line I think has gone bad. Okay. So we know that pulsars execute highly precise motion. So what and uh, why they execute this kind of precision and what's the reason, be, reason behind their high angle? Once you get something spinning, it's very difficult to make it change its spin. And that's basically why pulsars are precise and remain precise. They do gradually slow, and one day a pulsar will slow so much it hasn't enough energy to make the radio beam, and so we will no longer see it. But it's difficult to change the rotation speed of a body out in space on its own. So they keep, keep pulsing accurately. Yeah, so the next Last question from YouTube is how important is machine learning in the field of observational astronomy and what kind of softwares or data analysis tools we use for observing pulsars and magnetars? Right. Machine learning is becoming extremely important. Um, for instance, there's a big new telescope building in Chile called the Vera Rubin Telescope. Um, it will start work in a few years' time. And it's looking for things that flare up and die, transient phenomena. And it's going to have somewhere between 1 million and 10 million alerts per night. And there's no way people can handle that number of alerts. You know, the telescope, hey, there's something. Oh, hey, there's something. There's something. Mm. Another. There's another, there's another all night. So it's going to have to be done by computer. And there's going to have to be quite a lot of computer learning because we're not used to using computers. Well, we're getting used, but until recently, we've not been used to using computers for that. So machine learning there is going to be extremely important. Um, I'm not quite sure whether we want it with pulsars. I guess if we find there are a lot more fast radio bursts than we had suspected, yeah, maybe we'll use them for fast radio bursts more than for pulsars, to be honest. A bit like with the Vera Rubin telescope. But in many, many areas of astronomy, machine learning is becoming extremely important. It's a skill that um, astronomy students now have to have. So I had one question. So uh, there's a lot of discrepancy today regarding the alignment of magnetic and the spin axis of a pulsar. So how they evolve and all. So what are your comments on it? Yeah, the uh, magnetic axis has to be different from the spin axis if the beam is going to swing around the sky. If the two were aligned, then you would see a steady source when you were on axis and nothing when you were off axis. So it seems that the inclined 
magnetic field is extremely important for this exercise. But I accept it is a little peculiar that you have a magnetic field with one axis and a rotation with a different axis. But that's what it seems to be. Okay. So I guess we can take one question, last question from you, uh, Zoom by Justin Re Reggie. So Justin, you can unmute yourself. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Uh, ma'am, I have a question. Uh, what are the waveformers uh, we are obtaining from a radio telescope uh, for using an uh, approaching or like for analyzing it or imaging and radio? I'm sorry, the signal is cutting out quite a bit. Can you say that again? Oh, okay. What all waveformers we are obtaining from a radio telescope, uh, which we are used for, uh, like imaging or floating for different axes. Uh, what are the waveformers we are obtaining from the, this? Uh, I'm not sure I know what you mean by waveformers. I guess he's trying to ask the uh, radio waves we receive in our telescope, how they're converted and the image size. From it, a radio. How is the radio image is synthesized from the radio waves? He wants to ask. I guess. I'm sorry. Again, the line is cutting out, and I'm only hearing some words. I guess he wants to ask that how the radio waves which we are receiving from the source, how are they converted into radio images? All uh, right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, with a lot of computing. <laughs> Um, the maps of, of radio sources that you see are done uh, with a lot of long observing, um, probably many hours of observing. Uh, then you do some Fourier transforms to convert the signal that you pick up into a map. Okay, so there is one last question on YouTube re related to magnetars. So the person is asking, the magnetars are the residues of a supernova explosion, which do not form pulsars. So how will we distinguish between pulsars and magnetars? Yeah, um, at the moment we don't know. And there are relatively few magnetars. There's probably only about 30 magnetars, whereas there are about 300 pulse, 3000 pulsars. So we don't have a huge sample to help us answer that question. Um, but we do believe both come from supernovae. We also know that the magnetar's magnetic field is much bigger. So maybe the original star had a bigger magnetic field, perhaps. But the quick answer is we don't know yet. We don't understand why sometimes you get a pulsar and sometimes you get a magnetar. Right. So I just had one last question, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, when, whenever we detect a fast radio burst, it's not like our telescope is pointed in the perfect direction and it's all upon luck, right? That the telescope detects a fast radio burst. So whenever we detect the fast radio burst and after a few time, we again point it in that direction. Do we get some evidences of what the source might be? There's no evidence at the moment from direct observations. We don't see anything in that direction other than there was that burst. Okay. So that's still a discrepancy then. Mm. Yeah. So I guess we can uh, now I may ask Tanvi to conclude this lecture. Tanvi, you can start the video and conclude the lecture. Yeah. yeah yes, thank you, Pranav. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for a wonderful and insightful talk. I'd like to thank also thank you for taking the time out for today's webinar. Uh, I'd also like to thank all the partners.
participants and the professors who joined us today and made it even more special. We received a tremendous response from all over India as well as 10 different countries and we thank everybody who registered for today's webinar. And stay safe and thank you for joining us and stay tuned for more updates. Thank you. Thank you. So we have Raka Dabade ma'am over here. So Dabade ma'am, can do you have any few words to say? I have asked to unmute you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Prabhanjan. Actually, um, uh, I also was having some problems with the uh, uh, streaming here. So that's why I, I requested uh, Tanvi. So uh, in today's lecture, as Tanvi mentioned, we had more than 500 uh, participants from various countries, including India. And uh, I'm really thankful to, um, of course, Jocelyn Bell, madam. Uh, for her time and for her enthusiasm and i'm sure from today's lecture most of the students will be inspired to take radio astronomy as their career and uh, it would have been really nice if we would have had Jocelyn madam in Ferguson college especially in our amphitheater and i'm really missing that part you know usually when we have kind of lectures in the college so hopefully Jocelyn madam in future we hope to see you in Ferguson college and meet you in person so thank you everybody and also i would like to thank uh, professor sanjeev dhurandar also Sahih and Joyce Bakshi who have also joined the live streaming. And thank you all. Thank you again, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. It was a great talk and it was, of course, great meeting you, ma'am. Thank you very much for yeah. all your help. Thank you for giving a talk. It was very inspiring and it was very nice to meet you in person. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am.